Baffin Island's northern coastline. From rugged islands and Arctic fjords lining Baffin Bay to the snow-capped peaks and contours of the Borden Peninsula, exploring the unique hamlet of Pond Inlet. Well, I think when the whalers came up here, they thought they were the first people to penetrate this part of the, the globe. The awe-inspiring vistas of Sumalik National Park. The Arctic is an incredible part of the Canadian imaginary. I believe that it's part of who we think we are. And a northern cultural timeline that has endured thousands of years. It makes me wonder about my ancestors, how they traveled through the land. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada over the edge. High above the waters of Baffin Bay, we approach Nova Zembla Island and the shores of Canada's high Arctic. Baffin Bay measures more than 600,000 square kilometers, a massive body of water separating Greenland from Canada's Arctic archipelago. This is where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Arctic Ocean. And here, in the heat of Arctic summer, we witness a rare sight. Open water stretches for kilometers with Coots Inlet to the southwest and the spectacular North Arm. North Arm extends 40 kilometers inland, a majestic northern fjord with steep cliff faces rising more than a kilometer high. Through much of the year, the waters of North Arm experience one of Earth's harshest climates. It is an environment that has been endured by the Dorset and Thule cultures for thousands of years. And it is a landscape that has baffled European explorers for centuries. Martin Frobisher sailed here in 1576, then John Davis in 1585. They could not have imagined the scope of this landmass. In 1616, William Baffin began charting much of the island's east coast, including these waters, more than 500 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. And lining North Arm, massive expanses of snow and ice rise even higher. As we ascend the fjord's glacier runoff, the ice fields of McCulloch Glacier stretch as far as the eye can see. The Baffin Island interior is marked by a vast mountainous spine, a northern extremity of the Canadian Shield. Geologists believe massive ice sheets that once covered Canada originated here some 18,000 years ago. Today, much of the region remains encased in snow and ice.
And here, among the snow-capped summits, Kijivik Mountain rises more than 1,900 meters. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It is Northern Baffin Island's highest point and is known as one of Canada's ultra-prominent peaks. Continuing northwest, the ice fields of McCulloch Glacier gradually recede. Here, Arctic summer reveals tundra extending for kilometers. But it is a rare sight. This stretch of Baffin Island is covered in snow and ice nine months of the year. Moving north, we trace the contours of Salmon River. This winding waterway has been a valuable resource for generations. A habitat for Arctic char. And as a destination for early explorers in search of coal and gold. Finally, in the distance, Salmon River empties into a body of water known as Eclipse Sound, with more snow-capped peaks on the horizon. Looking back to the east, the hills rise again. Here, fog and mist shroud the rock faces of Mount Herodie, rising 434 meters from the sea. And as we descend the contours of nearby Mount Morin, the shores of Eclipse Sound meet us once more. Clip Sound is a vast waterway separating Baffin Island from Bylet Island to the north. It is also where the vast expanse of Canada's high Arctic meets modern civilization. As we trace the perimeter of northern Baffin Island, we reach one of the rare settlements in Canada's far north. Pond Inlet lies above the 72nd parallel. 
It is a designation shared by just three other communities in Northern Canada, Arctic Bay, Resolute, and Grease Fjord. Only Russia and Greenland extend this far north. Located more than 8,000 kilometers above the equator, it stands as one of the world's northernmost communities. Pond Inlet has been home to human civilization for thousands of years, with the Dorset people arriving some 3,000 years ago, then mysteriously disappearing. 1,500 years later, the Thule people arrived, ancestors to the modern Inuit. Pond Inlet is known locally as Mittimatalik, or the place where Mitima is buried, an homage to an ancient resident. While locals still use the name, the identity of Mitima is a mystery. Today, Pond Inlet's population is largely of Inuit descent. But there is also a hearty contingent of those from the South keen to experience this thriving community. Many come and go, but some stay for decades. My name is Philippa Utova. I'm the community archivist in the beautiful Pond Inlet, Nunavut. Pond Inlet is situated in Canada's high Arctic, about 72 degrees 69 north and 77 degrees 95 latitude. When you talk about the high Arctic people, automatically think of long, dark nights and cold and winter. Yes, we do have darkness in the winter from about mid-November to mid-January. But in fact, as you can see today, it's a beautiful day. We have sunshine. Our temperatures in the summer can go up to 18 degrees thereabouts. And it's not just the heat. Summer temperatures are enhanced by 24-hour sunlight, a balance to harsh winter conditions that would have confronted the first settlers here. Well, I think when the whalers came up here, they thought they were the first people to penetrate this part of the, the globe. It was so unknown, but in fact, it, it has been populated. Today's Inuit were in fact not the first people. The Dorset culture and was followed by the Thule culture, which are the actual ancestors of today's Inuit. Originally, the area was named, not the town, but the area was named Ponds Bay, and this was in 1818 when John Ross arrived on an expeditionary ship. Uh, he named it after John Ponds, an astronomer royal in Britain, nothing to do with the local Inuit. But in fact, the Inuit had named this area Mittimatalik for many years before that. In later years, when the Hudson Bay Company and the RCMP moved in, the name was transferred to this area as Pond Inlet. Today, the hamlet is home to 1,300 people, most with ties that date back generations. And that is where Philippa Utova's passion for history has become a major contribution to the community. The idea of developing archives started as I worked in the library. Uh, the elders were very concerned that information was not being passed on to the younger generation. Children were moving on to television and things, so photographs seemed to be the best way of connecting the elderly and the young, and that also was supported by the collection of uh, historical books, as many as we could find. And that was the beginning of uh, archives. Well, this is the Pond Inlet Archives. It's a community archives uh, with a focus on preserving local history. One of our priorities is photographs. Uh, this is an example of some of the photographs that we have collected from people who lived here in the past or their relatives have lived here in the past and they're willing to donate uh, 
um, some of their collection to the, to the community. Uh, we very much encourage that because it's a wonderful way of elders and youth uh, connecting. The wonderful thing is that many times uh, today's Inuit have never seen pictures of their relatives and they can then see, see pictures of family members that they may have met once or twice but could also uh, see in a photograph and share with their children themselves. The photo collection helps recall a different era in Pond Inlet, just decades ago, when many residents lived a nomadic lifestyle, living on the land. Another interesting thing, although more recent, is from the 1970s. This is a collection of local newspapers, and it was done in the days before typewriters with Inuktitut syllabics, uh, which of course is the language of the community, so it was all done by hand, and the English was done on a typewriter. The drawings were done by hand also, and it is just daily record really of what went on, what was act the activities of the community at the time, um, what was happening, who was visiting, skidoos were for sale, um, anything of interest to the community. And that, of course, is what becomes so interesting later on in years to come uh, to compare with today and how things have changed in such a short time. And one corner of the archives reveals a wealth of treasures. Inuit language materials, including dictionaries, encyclopedias, and the written histories of the region's elders. The documents date back centuries, as early as 1835. And one of the other interesting parts of our collection is the Archives Northern Reference Collection. This is a collection of books about the North and the history. And one of our prize books, one of our oldest ones, is a volume written by Sir John Ross, who, as I mentioned earlier, was the person who gave the name Ponds Bay to this area. It's a narrative of the Northwest Passage, and of course, the Northwest Passage is still today a very popular transit way. Originally, they were trying to get to the Orient. Now, people are just trying to say that they've been able to travel it themselves in the footsteps of all the explorers. For many, Philippa Utova's life journey that began in England may seem strange, but for her, Canada's north was a calling that could not be ignored. Well, I have lived here many years. I came with a great interest in the north and a passion for seeing northern Canada. I was very welcomed by Inuit when I first came here, of course, and that really helps. You want to stay longer. Uh, I met my husband here. He's uh, from this community, and we have four children and several, five grandchildren now. <laughs> and of course, one stays where one's home is. Pond Inlet marks one of the rare communities on northern Baffin Island. It is a major commercial and transportation hub in the Kiki Taluk, or Baffin region. But just beyond the hamlet's boundaries, some of the world's most stunning landscapes stretch as far as the eye can see. As we head west along the edge of Canada's northern expanse to Nuiak Talak Point and Ek Eper Iak Talak Point extend far out to sea and lead to massive fjords on the horizon.
And in the distance, a massive headland or cliff face dropping straight to the sea. It is stunning Kobignalik headland, rising nearly a kilometer high. It marks the entrance to Oliver Sound, a pristine waterway connected to Eclipse Sound and part of Sermalik National Park. Further, the landscape changes as we approach a series of unique islands and winding waterways. Here, Frechette Island and Emerson Island are surrounded by Tay Sound and Packet Sound, extending kilometers to the south. Even here, in the heart of Baffin Island's beauty, it is difficult to comprehend the sheer size of this island. Baffin Island is 1,500 kilometers long and measures more than 500,000 square kilometers. It is more than 15 times the size of Vancouver Island. Amazingly, virtually all of Baffin Island remains uninhabited, home to just 11,000 people. It is the largest island in Canada and the fifth largest in the world. Continuing west, we descend from the mountains and fjords on approach to the waters of Eclipse Sound. Icebergs are a common sight here incredible frozen masses that reveal just one-eighth their true size. This berg has drifted more than 1,000 kilometers from the west coast of Greenland. Icebergs on Baffin Bay can travel roughly three kilometers a day, with many making their way as far south as Newfoundland and beyond. Here, they stand as a testament to the beauty of the region. And some, like this one, are a favorite spot for seals to catch some Arctic summer sun. Further, we explore the majestic sea life of Milne Inlet. Milne Inlet is more than 40 kilometers long, with Ragged Island marking its northern boundary with Eclipse Sound. And here, from high above, ripples can be seen a disturbance on this otherwise calm waterway. A closer look reveals hundreds of narwhal.
Milne Inlet is one of the world's best known calving grounds for these unicorns of the sea. Narwhals are medium-sized whales, often seen in groups of 15 or 20. They can range in size from four to six meters, weighing 1,600 kilograms. But they are best known for their massive tusks, a feature proudly displayed by mature adult males. This sword-like tooth can reach nearly three meters. No one knows exactly what it's used for. Some say it can dig holes in sea ice. Others believe the size of the tusk determines social standing. In total, Canada is a summer home to 80,000 narwhal, a population that migrates to the open waters of Davis Strait and Baffin Bay in the winter. They are a prize catch for hunters. Legend says the Vikings exported narwhal tusks in the Middle Ages, reaching Europe and the Far East, where it earned the mythical nickname, Unicorn of the Sea. Today, they are a key source of income for Inuit hunters. Narwhal tusks can be sold for hundreds, even thousands of dollars. North of Mill Inlet, the waters of Eclipse Sound lie at the heart of a key Arctic protected area. This incredible expanse of wilderness is known as Sermalik National Park. It is a massive area, measuring 22,000 square kilometers, jointly managed by local Inuit and Parks Canada. My name is Jana Mokosak and I work in Simulik National Park as an interpretation officer in Pond Inlet. The park was created in 1999. It, it was created so that our land could be protected and preserved for future generations. The significance of the park name Similic mean place of glaciers, and majority of our park is made up of glaciers, rock, and ice. Sermalik National Park is one of the largest parks in Canada. It includes a marine area, as well as four separate parcels of land. Right behind me, you can see the incredible Bylet Island, which has been a protected area since before it was Similic National Park. 
The Borden Peninsula is just to the west, and it is a, basically a large plateau of mountains undercut by some amazing braided river valleys. And it houses some, as well as archaeological remains, there's some really cool old hoodoos, so fantastic blocky red and ochre sandstone towers leaping out of the ridge lines, which are pretty stunning. The tiniest little piece is just to the west of that. It's another set of sea cliffs for nesting birds called Bellarge Bay. And a little bit closer, but also to the west of us, is the marine portion of the park, which is Oliver Sound. And this is your classic steep-sided fjord. It's a beautiful place for kayaking and boating and is well worth visiting. The park is home to a diverse spectrum of life, from hardy arctic plants to animals inhabiting land and sea. One of the fantastic things about Simulik National Park is that it lies in an area of incredible diversity. Their life here is rich, both terrestrial and marine. The kind of wildlife we have up here, polar bear, in some areas, there's a caribou. With sea mammals, there's a ring seal, harp seal, bullhead whales, narwhal, and beluga. But unlike many parks, there is a crucial cultural element as well. Sermalik National Park is a harvesting ground for indigenous peoples. For centuries, Inuit hunters have sustained their families and communities with the rich plant and animal life found on land and sea. In the park, there are some archaeological sites, remains such as sod houses, bones, artifacts, and other tools that were used by the Inuit before they were known as the Thule culture. And Inuit come from the Thule culture and today they still use it. Some people have outpost camps around the area and Inuit still go hunting using the land. Today, with Sermalik's park status, the land is shared between modern day harvesters and adventurous tourists alike. When visitors are planning to come up to our park, I think their expectation is that there'll be a a lot of ice and a lot of nothing. <laughs> but after visiting, they realize that there's more to the Arctic, there's more wildlife, and that uh, this environment, even though it's so huge, it's very sensitive. People come up here for a number of reasons. The landscape is stunning, and there's an incredible culture in the area as well, which is another draw for people. Uh, the Arctic is... The Arctic is an incredible part of the Canadian imaginary. I believe that it's part of who we think we are and how it makes us Canadian. For Jenna Mukasek, protecting the Sermalik area means her children can be raised along the same shores as she was and her family before her. Seeing this land, our home, and the different characteristics like the glaciers, the, the mountains, the land, it makes me wonder about my ancestors, how they traveled through the land and what they experienced going through the land, using the land, and going day by day. Heading north over Eclipse Sound, we return to glacier country as we soar above the stunning features of Sermalik National Park.
25 kilometers north of Pond Inlet, Violet Island is a protected gem with a diverse landscape. Here, steep ocean cliffs and lowland tundra are a perfect habitat for seabirds. Three hundred twenty thousand thick billed murres. Fifty thousand black legged kittiwakes. And thousands of greater snow geese utilize the area. Continuing to the center of the island, Violet Island's glaciers ascend rapidly. Ice fields stretch for kilometers. Here, mountains like the Castle Gables are part of the Bayam Martin Mountains, running east to west along the northern half of the island. The mountains are part of the Arctic Cordillera chain that extend 1,300 kilometers from Labrador in the south to Ellesmere Island in the far north. Further, we pass Obelisk Mountain and Malik Mountain, which at more than 1,900 meters is the highest point on the island. Further, the mountains recede as we reach the northern extremity of Violet Island and the waters of Lancaster Sound. It is a stunning shoreline, adorned with rocks and jagged ice, and home to the region's most iconic animal, the polar bear. They are majestic creatures, perfectly equipped for the harsh Arctic climate. With dark skin to absorb the heat of the sun and thick white fur for camouflage and warmth. And beneath it all, a thick layer of fat to keep them warm. Polar bears thrive on land or sea. They are considered marine mammals and can swim nearly 10 kilometers per hour. Heading west, we follow the shores of Lancaster Sound across Navy Board Sound to the shores of the Borden Peninsula. Here, we trace the contours of the Killatee River.
Not far inland, the walls of the river valley rise, and we experience one of the region's most breathtaking landscapes. The Borden Hoodoos are tall towers of sedimentary rock, carved over centuries by water and wind. A stunning contrast to the ice fields of Bylet Island just kilometers away. At the northern extremity of Baffin Island, the Borden Peninsula is a scenic gem. Here, west of Sermalik National Park and the Borden Hoodoos, we soar above deep river valleys, Arctic tundra, and snow-capped rolling hills. But 50 kilometers to the west, the landscape changes again on approach to spectacular Strathcona Sound. Strathcona Sound stretches some 50 kilometers from the peaks of the Borden Peninsula to the waters of Admiralty Inlet. Its cliff walls rise majestically, a hidden Arctic geological wonder. And halfway to the waters of Admiralty Inlet, we reach the abandoned town of Nana Civic. Nana Civic was once an industrial hotbed with a bright future. In 2007, the Canadian government announced Nana Civic would be the site for Canada's first northern deep water port, part of an attempt to further develop the north. But years later, nothing has happened. A deep water port remains a dream. And further inland, Nana Civic was the site of Canada's first Arctic mine, extracting zinc for more than 25 years. It closed in 2002, and the town closed with it. All that remains is an airport and mining roads that were part of Nana Civic's most unique feature. Nana Civic was home to one of the world's most famous road races, the Midnight Marathon. A mecca for runners from around the world who thought they had done it all.
Beyond Nanasivik, we reach the western extremity of the Borden Peninsula and move from a ghost town to a modern day community. Arctic Bay lies on the shores of Adams Sound, with Admiralty Inlet beyond. Arctic Bay marks the end of our journey. Located even further north than Pond Inlet, one of just three Canadian communities above the 73rd parallel. A true gem in Canada's high Arctic. From the stunning waters of Baffin Bay and remote Nova Zembla Island, to the community of Pond Inlet and Bylet Island to the north, to the natural wonders of Sermalik National Park, Northern Baffin Island is a scenic journey unlike any other. It's ice fields and hoodoos. Steep cliffs and frigid waters. And incredible animal life are a timeless wonder. Nearly untouched since the arrival of European explorers and the indigenous people before them. Years later, Baffin Island remains a wonder that many have imagined, but few will experience. Here, on the edge of Canada. Canada's high Arctic. From the northernmost extremity of the world's fifth largest island to the highest point in mainland North America. Protecting the waters of Lancaster Sound for future generations. For the Arctic, it's a hugely important, um, ecologically important area. An annual adventure stalking Canada's far north for winter. A sea lift is bringing cargo on land for all the people that live here, and it's necessary because they need, they need the cargo to, to live. And artists of the Arctic bringing this vast landscape to life. To this day, I just carve little pieces to survive. 
Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada, over the edge. On the northwest tip of Baffin Island, in Canada's high Arctic, the hamlet of Arctic Bay lies on the shores of Adams Sound. Arctic Bay is located just north of the 73rd parallel, the third northernmost community in Canada. It dates back to 1936, with the establishment of a Hudson's Bay trading post and the arrival of Inuit from Pangnertung and Cape Dorset, who were relocated here. Today, Arctic Bay is home to some 750 hardy residents. Ninety-five percent of the population is of Inuit descent. While the community of Arctic Bay was established in the 20th century, locals say the region has been inhabited for 5,000 years. They call Arctic Bay Ikpiarjuk, translated the pocket from the Inuktitut language. It is a reference to the community's sheltered location on a south-facing gravel beach surrounded by incredible hills. From May 6th to August 6th, Arctic Bay enjoys 24-hour sunlight. But by September, summer will be forgotten with winter and 24-hour darkness on its way. In the high Arctic summer, Arctic Bay is a stopping place for cruise ships and pleasure craft sailing the Northwest Passage. But vessels like this have a narrow window. Sea ice in Admiralty Inlet doesn't melt until the end of July, making water travel impossible for most of the year. It is a reality of life in Arctic Bay, a fact that makes Nunavut Sea Link and Supplies annual visit crucial for the survival of the community. Roma Laframboise coordinates operations on the ground, moving winter supplies from an offshore cargo ship to smaller barges and finally to shore. A sea lift is bringing cargo on land for all the people that live here, and it's necessary because they need, they need the cargo to, to live by. Like for the co-op, we bring food and uh, everything that's necessary for, the, for life around here. There is a transportation by plane, but it, it costs much more than by boat, and we have uh, the quantities we can, uh, we can load on the boat is, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's 10, 20 times more than the plane, so uh, it costs much less, that's why. Laframboise and team spend weeks each year resupplying communities throughout the Eastern Arctic. We start by loading the boat in Montreal, in St. Catherine, and then uh, we come here and I do the log logistics, make sure that every crate's off and every, every crate's in, in good order. 
and then the, they, take, they take the crane, they empty the, the lower holes, the, the, the twin decks, the, the, the bridge, and then they put it on the barge. The two biggest uh, items we had here, they were, uh, they, they were tanks for the for the colic energy. I mean, the, the guys that, for power, Nunavut power, they were tanks that were about, uh, I'd say, 50 feet long. Uh, so they carried it with two loaders all the way up there. And then we have smaller crates all the way down to maybe a uh, foot by a foot. That, that's, that, that's, we got vehicles, we got, uh, sometimes we got heavy vehicles like excavators, carry anything. Sometimes we carry a mobile, mobile home, uh, it's, uh, but mostly it's containers. Offshore, Charles Cote of Riviere de Loup, Quebec, moves supplies from ship to shore. Mon nom Charles Cote. Euh, je suis un marin du Anna des Gagnés. Euh, sur le bateau, on a environ euh, 20 000 mètres cubes à bord de, de général cargo, soit de conteneurs, véhicules. Oui, on est équipé de quatre crains plus un jumbo lift. Les quatre crains, euh, c'est des 45 tonnes. Et le jumbo lift, c'est pour lever les, les bulldozers, loaders, tout ce qui est de 125 tonnes et moins. Il y a une capacité de 125 tonnes maximum. C'est euh, beaucoup d'organisation. On a un bon planning. On a un toolbox meeting à chaque matin qui nous disent, ils nous expliquent quoi faire. Bon, mais maintenant, je vais retourner à l'ouvrage. Merci. The resupply mission, or sea lift as it is known, is one of the most highly anticipated days of the year in Arctic Bay. Residents eagerly await oil tanks, sofas, televisions, even trucks, purchased and shipped from the south. And it's not just special for residents of Arctic Bay. For La Framboise, the sea lift has become tradition. For Cote, it is in his blood. Well, it's my fourth year uh, doing doing the, the the sea lift up north. Uh, my first year, I was really surprised by uh, I mean by the scenery and the, by it's it's really the wilderness. Really, it's uh, it's somebody who's never been here and he just works down south. When he comes here, it's another world completely. It's almost like another planet. C'est spécial euh, parce que je suis la quatrième génération à travailler sur les bateaux de ma famille. Euh, mon grand-père est déjà venu ici dans les années 60. Puis moi, ben, je fais comme continuer la tradition. Arctic Bay sits just meters from the protected waters of Adams Sound. Its harbor is a safe haven, nestled between a series of geological wonders. Holy Cross Point to the east and Uluxan Point to the west. Heading west, the Aluxan Peninsula rises high. Here, the St. George's Society cliffs dominate the horizon. The cliffs are a mix of dolomite and shale, rising 250 meters from the sea. They are a popular hike for visitors to Arctic Bay, keen to experience the beauty of the region. But these cliffs and the water surrounding 
are more than just a scenic destination. They have been a valuable source of natural resources for centuries. Generations ago, slate found here was harvested and used to produce Inuit tools. And the waters of Adams Sound were valuable fishing grounds for the Inuit and explorers like Captain William Adams, the first European to reach Arctic Bay in 1872. In total, the St. George's Society Cliffs and the Aluxon Peninsula stretch nearly 10 kilometers to Aluxon Point and the open waters of Admiralty Inlet beyond. Moving north, beyond the Aluxon Peninsula, we reach Graveyard Point. Graveyard Point is located opposite Cape Strathcona and marks the southern boundary between Admiralty Inlet and incredible Strathcona Sound. Here, just kilometers from Admiralty Inlet, steep cliff faces and hoodoo structures rise high. These vivid colors are a mix of dark red mudstones and shales, along with gray sandstones and slit stones. It is a rich geological wonder extending for kilometers and part of a geological region known as the Strathcona Sound Formation. Strathcona Sound is named after Donald Smith also known as Lord Strathcona. He was a Scottish Canadian, famous in the late 19th and early 20th century as a member of the First Council of the Northwest Territories and president of the Canadian Pacific Railway. A century after his death, these awe-inspiring marvels continue his legacy. Next, we head west across the open waters of Admiralty Inlet. Admiralty Inlet was first charted by Sir Edmund Perry in 1820. It stretches some 250 kilometers south from Lancaster Sound 
separating the Borden Peninsula on the east from the Brodeur Peninsula to the west. Admiralty Inlet has been called the world's largest fjord. On land, the Brodeur Peninsula is a massive headland, a parcel of land extending far out to sea. The Brodeur Peninsula was given its name by explorer Joseph Bernier during a 1907 expedition, naming it in honor of Louis-Philippe Brodeur, Minister of Marine and Fisheries at the time. It is surrounded by Admiralty Inlet to the east, Prince Regent Inlet to the west, and Lancaster Sound to the north. It is a remote scenic wonder. Finally, on approach to Cape Crawford, chunks of sea ice stretch as far as the eye can see. And further, just below the 74th parallel, we approach Sergeant Point. With remote Devon Island on the horizon, Sergeant Point marks an important milestone. It is the northernmost point of land on Baffin Island, the fifth largest island in the world. Heading south from the northernmost point on Baffin Island, we trace the eastern perimeter of the Brodeur Peninsula. It is a stunning Arctic landmass, featuring plateaus, cliffs, and further inland, rivers, streams, and valleys. Here on the coast, the Turner Cliffs stretch for kilometers. They are part of a geological region known as the Admiralty Group, a mix of dolomite and quartz sandstones rising more than 400 meters.
The Turner Cliffs are from the Cambrian and Ordovician era. Rock roughly 500 million years old. At that time, the Brodeur Peninsula and the land surrounding were located near the equator, covered by shallow seas. Today, fossils containing tiny invertebrae can be found in these hills. Continuing south, we approach St. Patrick's Canyon and just offshore, one of the Arctic's world famous attractions. Each year, some 40,000 icebergs calve from Greenland's glaciers. While many make their way south to Newfoundland and Labrador, some drift into Lancaster Sound and into Admiralty Inlet. They are a common but spectacular sight here. Icebergs can be hundreds of meters long weighing more than 10 million tons and measure 30% wider below surface than above. They are more than 10,000 years old, incredible cathedrals of the Arctic seas. Further south, beyond Kakiak Point, the geological wonders of the region rise to new heights. Here, a breathtaking set of rock structures rises from the sea. It is a spectacle known locally as the gallery.
The gallery formation marks the southern portion of the Admiralty Group, with rocks slightly older than the Turner Cliffs to the north. These ethereal wonders are made of quartz-rich sandstone, carved by ancient winding rivers over millions of years. Offshore, the waters of Admiralty Inlet line the horizon. They are key waters for navigation, for tourism, and fishing. And today, they are part of a proposed protected area. The Lancaster Sound National Marine Protected Area is an idea that has been in the works for decades one that someday could protect much of the eastern Arctic's waters. Lancaster Sound is at the uh, entrance to the Northwest Passage in the eastern Arctic. And uh, st studies over the last 50 years have shown it's extremely important ecologically and culturally. Back in the 1970s, the initial idea to protect this area was a result of oil and gas exploration. And uh, through the years, there's been different, uh, different attempts to work on that. And, and in 2009, the QIA, which is a Kikitani Inuit Association, the federal government and Governor Nunavut signed an agreement uh, to uh, study the feasibility of creating a marine conservation area. A protected area in Lancaster Sound would be different from conventional national parks by recognizing the unique natural and cultural connections to the area. By comparison with national parks, uh, where their primary goal is uh, management for conservation, public education and enjoyment, uh, national marine conservation areas have an additional goal of management for ecological uh, sustainability. What that means is that traditional activities such as fishing, uh, uh, resource harvesting by Inuit can continue. We have five communities uh, associated with this uh, proposed boundary and that includes uh, Clyde River, Pond Inlet, Arctic Bay, Resolute Bay and Grease Fjord. And essentially, the, uh, the waterways surrounding uh, Bylet Island and Lancaster Sound are kind of the social and economic um, uh, lifeblood, as you would say, for the, for the community residents. Uh, they're the transportation corridors. Uh, the, the, it provides food and resources for them. Uh, the local people, you know, depend on the resources that are here. Carrie Elvram says while traditional harvest would continue, the protected status would be a benefit, restricting natural resource exploration in the area, an area he believes is unique in the world. Well, there's a lot of marine mammals and uh, seabirds that uh, uh, reside here. Um, we have the iconic polar bear. Uh, we have several whale species, uh, including bowhead, uh, beluga and narwhal. Uh, the odd killer whale comes up here. We have uh, several seal species, um, walrus, uh, and a number of birds from uh, kittiwakes, fulmers, um, you know, and a variety of other sea ducks. I've been to many, many different places uh, across Canada, 
And uh, I've discovered that each place has a uniqueness about it that makes it special. And uh, it, you have a, an, a, has an ability to grab you and feel connected to, to your environment in a different way. And uh, this place has been tremendous in that respect for me. You get a surreal moments and uh, almost transcend space and time and you can imagine what people used to, what it used to be like for people to live here. Fifty kilometers west of the Brodeur Peninsula, Somerset Island measures more than 24,000 square kilometers. The island is the ninth largest in the Arctic archipelago and ranks among the largest uninhabited islands in the world. Somerset Island is 260 kilometers long and ranges from 35 to 170 kilometers wide. It features two main geological landscapes. To the southwest, an elevated area lining the waters of Peel Sound reveals exposed Precambrian granite. And here in the northeast, vast expanses of sedimentary rock stretch for kilometers. There is almost no vegetation or shelter. But despite the elements, Somerset Island is home to animal life. Here, muskox have been making a comeback in recent decades. They are incredible mammals with thick fur coats capable of enduring bitter winters and an awe-inspiring sight on this barren Arctic landscape. Continuing south, Somerset Island narrows. It is bordered by Barrow Strait to the north, Prince Regent Inlet to the east, and Peel Sound to the west. To the south, Somerset Island is lined by one of the North's most unique waterways, Bellet Strait. Locals say Bellet Strait is one of the few year-round ice-free waterways in the region. And it was here, on Bellet Strait's North Shore, that the Hudson's Bay Company established their final trading post in 1937. Fort Ross was supposed to link the east and west fur trading regions of the Arctic.
The fort had two buildings, a store and a manager's residence. But barely a decade after it was built, Fort Ross was relocated south, with heavy ice to the east and west, making commerce impossible. Just two kilometers away, we reach Bellet Strait's barren southern shore. Here, at the northern extremity of Murchison Promontory, Zenith Point represents a unique geographic landmark. Located 64 kilometers above Barrow, Alaska, this remote corner of Canada is the northernmost point in mainland North America. Continuing south, beyond the Murchison Promontory, we soar above the vast expanses of the Boothia Peninsula. The Boothia Peninsula measures more than 30,000 square kilometers, a vast tundra plateau. The first European explorer to reach the peninsula was Sir James Ross. He named it Boothia Felix in honor of the patron of his expedition, Sir Felix Booth. And it was here in 1831 that Ross determined the first location of the North Magnetic Pole. With changes to the Earth's magnetic core, the pole has since moved further north to Ellesmere Island and beyond. On the ground, the Boothia Peninsula is covered in stone, limestone sediments, and granite bedrock, a landscape that becomes more rugged each kilometer south. Finally, this rocky trajectory leads to civilization and the community of Talawayok. Talawayok lies at the southwestern coast of the Boothia Peninsula. It is home to 850 people, with 98% of the population of Inuit descent. The community, once known as Spence Bay, was moved here in 1948 when the Hudson's Bay Company closed Fort Ross and relocated south. Talawayok is translated large caribou hunting blind from Inuktitut, a reference to large piles of stones built along traditional caribou migration routes to aid in hunting.
Today, the Talawiak region remains popular for hiking, hunting, and fishing. One hundred twenty five kilometers to the southwest, Joe Haven is another eastern Arctic gem located on the western shores of King William Island. It is home to more than a thousand people and boasts a unique landscape, a community built on Arctic sand. Residents of Talawiak and Joe Haven are descendants of the ancient Thule peoples and have inhabited this region for more than a thousand years. Many still spend months each year on the land, continuing and developing local traditions. My name is Charlie Oakbeek, and I'm from Joe Haven, Nunavut, and I'm a carver. I started carving about 20 years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago, and then to this day, I just carve little pieces to survive. Stone carving is a way of life for many in Joe Haven. And while Upik completes his carvings here, the process begins many kilometers away. When it's fall time, winter time, when the ice is thick enough, we go about south from here, about 80 kilometers, and 50, 50 kilometers ocean, and about 30 kilometers inland. We go pick up the soapstone during the winter and then bring it back by Kamutix. Upik's workstation is located at the foot of his driveway, with dust making indoor carving impossible. His table is adorned with tools, stones, even whale bones, donated to him by local residents keen to help out. Okay, this is where I carve. This is my lamp, homemade lamp, for staying bright. It's out of my, my light out there is out of order. And uh, this is my five inch grinder with a four and a half inch diamond blade. After I cut everything up with this, I start smoothing up with that diamond blade with the carbide bits. The process begins with a simple ax, getting rid of unwanted cracks and chunks of rock that won't make the final cut. Upik's specialty is carving exotic faces, a trademark of Joe Haven carvers. Right now I'm just cutting up a piece of rock, uh, probably gonna be a face. Not worth anything right now, but Probably in the end, probably trade trade the rock with them some some money. So I got no time for that, so I better get the show on a roll here. I do some small faces, bigger faces, uh, out of soapstone. A little bit different from animals, and so many people could make animals, and so some people like seeing different little stuff sometimes. But you know, sometimes they're pretty silly. They're pretty funny carvings, and they're freaky and stuff like that. 
Charlie Upik could practice his craft in many locations, but for him, his decision to return home decades ago was an easy one. It's my hometown, I guess, and I grew up here. So I was in and out of Joe Haven for, since I was 20 or something. Uh, came back and stayed back here then, so from 94. To this day, I'm here, and I do a little bit of carving on my table. And, survive, I guess. From the soaring geological wonders of Strathcona Sound and Admiralty Inlet. To stunning sea ice tracing the northernmost reaches of Baffin Island. to the rocky contours of Somerset Island and the Boothia Peninsula. Canada's high Arctic is a stunning mix of landscapes on land and on water. It's friendly, timeless communities extreme geographic boundaries, and awe-inspiring abundant ocean life make the high Arctic a nearly untouched wonder. Thousands of years after humans first arrived on these shores, the seasons and cycles of nature continue to determine life here. A world-class wonder waiting to be discovered here on the edge of Canada. Canada's central Arctic region, from the vast expanse of King William Island and the hamlet of Joe Haven to Victoria Island and the Arctic hub of Cambridge Bay, a cultural timeline stretching back thousands of years. We have a lot of uh, cultural activities here in Cambridge Bay and one of them we performed was the drum dancing. Searching for the Northwest Passage, the explorers came through here and they wintered here for three years in 1900, 1903. And explorers carrying on that tradition. You can't afford to push it in this place. Uh, if it lets you out, it lets you out. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada over the edge.
High above Canada's central Arctic region, the waters of Wellington Strait lead to Cape Norton and one of Canada's most remote inhabited islands. King William Island is located just north of the North American mainland, part of the Arctic archipelago. It is a vast open frontier, measuring more than 13,000 square kilometers. It is the 15th largest island in Canada and the 61st largest in the world. King William Island is located in the heart of Canada's Northern Territory, known as Nunavut. It is also part of Nunavut's Kitikmiot region, a massive expanse measuring more than 450,000 square kilometers. Most of the region is uninhabited, home to less than 5,000 people spread across remote communities like Talawiak, Kugluktuk, and Cambridge Bay. They are only accessible by sea or air. And here, on the southeastern extremity of King William Island, we approach one of the region's best-known settlements, it is the hamlet of Joe Haven. Joe Haven is located just north of the 68th parallel, one degree above the Arctic Circle. It is 2,100 kilometers north of the city of Winnipeg and the only settlement on King William Island. For much of the year, Joe Haven is covered in snow. Winter temperatures can reach minus 40 degrees Celsius. Sea ice surrounds the hamlet for nine months of the year. In the heat of Arctic summer, Joe Haven enjoys 24-hour sunlight from May 22nd to July 21st. And the rare warmth reveals one of Nunavut's most unique landscapes. Arctic desert stretches for kilometers with vast expanses of sand covering the limestone bedrock below. Joe Haven was officially established in 1961 with the opening of a trading post by the Hudson's Bay Company, a Canadian fur trading operation dating back to 1670. Today, it is home to roughly 1,100 people. But local Inuit have called this region home for centuries. They are known as the Netsilingmut peoples, translated, people of the place where there is sea. Together, they carry on the traditions of the past. Uh, my name is Katja Kirchner, and this is my friend Janet Aglukar, and we're both throat singers from Joe Haven, Nunavut. Long ago, the, the woman would um, throat sing when the men go out hunting, so time can go a bit faster. And 
they would throat sing when they have gatherings like drum dancing. Throat singing is considered one of the world's oldest forms of music. It is a vocal technique used by cultures around the world and one that Janet Aglukuk remembers fondly growing up in Joe Haven. I learned how to throat sing when I was maybe 11, 12. And it was really dry at first, the first time I learned, but I got used to it. And then I taught Kathy, and it was the same for her. We known each other since we were kids in school. Best friends. Yeah. She taught me how to throat sing. It was hard at first because each time we throat sing, we would stop quickly and laugh. <laughs> but we got used to it. Now we throat sing longer. The unique sound is nearly impossible to explain. New listeners say it is a combination of chanting, singing, and growling with body movement keeping the rhythm. The way we start off throating is we turn towards each other and we hold each other on like the elbow or the upper arm. And it's to move, so we, how do, how do you say it? It's hard to throat sing when we're just standing there and not moving. And it's much easier when we do this. When we like move. hold each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a rhythm. And while the songs may sound similar, they all have different meanings, well known to local performers and listeners alike. <laughs> Today, throat singing thrives in Joe Haven. And after more than two decades, it continues to be a source of inspiration for best friends Kathy Cooknook and Janet Aglukuk. Yeah, it's, it's important to continue or keep the throat singing alive because that's what our ancestors did. And it's, it's fun, it's exciting, it's funny, and it's just nice to learn. And they want to keep it going. Kids learn and they... Pass it on to the younger, yeah. younger generations. The hamlet of Joe Haven boasts one of the Arctic's most unique cultural landscapes. And while the Inuit timeline stretches back centuries, Joe Haven may be best known for its connection to early European explorers. For more than a century, Joe Haven has been a hub for adventurers seeking a maritime route through the Arctic Ocean, linking east and west. That route has come to be known as the Northwest Passage. My name is Jacob Kernach. I'm the uh, chairperson for the Nutjilik Heritage Society here in Joe Haven. The Inuktitut name for Joe Haven is Ukhruktuk, meaning that uh, land of uh, seal blubber. We have a lot of ring seal. That's probably why it's called Ukhruktuk, meaning um, a lot of blubber. Since the 19th century, explorers like John Ross, Roald Amundsen, and John Franklin have passed through Joe Haven. Roald Amundsen even spent two winters here, naming Joe Haven the finest little harbor in the world. The name of 
Joe is is off off um, Amundsen's um, sailboat. I believe his name was the the boat's name was Joe, and that's how this community became Joe Haven. The the, the explorers came through here and they wintered here for three years in 1903, around that area, and that's how it. After that, it became uh, a trading post and people start settle, settling here uh, around the uh, 1960s. Through oral history, Jacob Kahunik recalls first contact between his people and the first Europeans, a tense meeting that eventually grew into a lasting friendship. My ancestors said that uh, the, the explorers were carrying our rifles when they were meeting up with our local Inuit people. Um, to my knowledge, that was given to me. They slowly walked to each other. Um, that's how they met. The explorers eventually got knowledge from these Inuit people, and that's, that was a main way of uh, surviving up here. And I think that's, that's why they made it through the Northwest Passage. Today, a variety of buildings survive from Joe Haven's early days including the community's original trading post. This, this building here in, in my background is one of the oldest buildings that we have here in Joe Haven. It was once a trading post uh, without heat. Um, trappers would trade um, Arctic fox, polar bear, um, ring seal, uh, wolverine. Um, but back then, the main, the main trading was the Arctic white fox, and a lot of it happened here in the back, uh, in the building here. Um, it's owned, it was once owned by Hudson Bay Company, now it's owned by Northern Store. But the best view is found on a hill overlooking town, an homage to this unique port. We're at the end of the harbor, and this is one of the most important places. It's more like a historic place. Um, we have a Peterhead boat behind me, which was owned by the uh, missionary, Roman Catholic. It did a lot of traveling, picking up people, uh, moving people, um, moving a lot of supplies to other communities as well. Behind me is a cairn, and there's information on Franklin, and also uh, the first explorer that came through this Northwest Passage, Ronald Amundsen, and um, he was the first explorer that ever traveled through the Northwest Passage. For Jacob Kahunik, stories of adventure and exploration are a unique aspect of this region but just a small part of why he calls Joe Haven home. I moved here in 1965 with my parents and ever since I've been living here, I had my school here. I do my hunting, I do my, um, I'm, I work here before. And um, as of today, it's, it's huge. When I first moved here, there were probably around 50 people. Now it's a, a population of 1,300. Continuing west, we soar above the vast western expanse of King William Island. Here, limestone, gravel, and sand line the horizon. And while the landscape is flat, it is not dull. Ethereal colors stretch as far as the eye can see. On the coast, a maze of sandbars,
capes and tiny peninsulas stretch for kilometers, including Gladman Point, McClintock Bay, and Cape John Herschel. And on the ground, we see one of King William Island's most unique features. This is the Gladman Point radar station, an odd sight on the Arctic tundra. It is a Cold War relic, part of the distant early warning system built in the 1950s to detect the movement of Soviet aircraft. At that time, dozens of stations lined the 69th parallel from Alaska to the Eastern Arctic. Today, the Cold War dew line has been disbanded. Gladman Point and 46 other radar stations from the dew line era are part of a new surveillance system, a joint Canadian-US operation known as the Northern Warning System. Fifty kilometers further, we trace the western perimeter of King William Island. And beyond Hornby Island, we reach the open waters of Alexandria Strait. Alexandria Strait separates King William Island from the Royal Geographical Society Islands to the west. These barren islands were named by explorer Roald Amundsen more than a century ago. and the waters surrounding remain a mystery, largely uncharted. But they are home to an abundance of wildlife, including the awe-inspiring beluga whale. Belugas thrive in Arctic waters, traveling in pods like this one. They measure four to six meters in length, weighing more than 1,000 kilograms. They are majestic mammals of the sea and can live up to 50 years. West of Alexandria Strait and the Royal Geographical Society Islands, we approach the waters of Victoria Strait and the heart of the Northwest Passage. The European quest to complete the passage can be traced as early as 1819, 
when Edward Perry's mission ventured north into uncharted waters, west of Resolute, into Peel Sound. Other missions followed, many with tragic results. Finally, in 1903, Roald Amundsen chose a tiny six-man crew in a converted herring vessel he called Joe and embarked on a three-year journey, the first explorer to complete the Northwest Passage. Today, these waters continue to intimidate many modern mariners, but not all. Some continue to be drawn to these icy waters. I'm Jesse Osborne, captain of sailing vessel Empiricus, and uh, here sailing the Northwest Passage with my fiance. Well, you'd be surprised how many people don't know what the Northwest Passage is. It's cold and there's not much known about it. To sum it up, I'd just say it's challenging. Osborne is in the thick of a multi-year expedition to make it through the Northwest Passage from Alaska to Greenland. I started this journey in 2012, but I didn't get very far that year and I ran out of money. So uh, I went from Seward, Alaska to Kodiak Island in 2012. And then after working for a year, uh, began the major leg of the trip, which was last year, from Kodiak Island, out around the Aleutian chain, then up over the top of Alaska over Point Barrow, and then ended up in Cambridge Bay last year. And that's where we stopped the vessel in 2013. This year, Osborne and fiance Samantha Merritt have encountered tough weather from Cambridge Bay to Joe Haven. Today, they continue to wait on board their prize vessel for ice in the passage to clear. This is where I've done, well, all my sailing. This is the boat that I learned how to sail on. Empiricus is a 50-foot gaff-rigged yawl, and it was built by taking a 1943 Navy Liberty launch, a Navy lifeboat, and laying a one-inch fiberglass hull all the way around it. So the, the old wooden boat was used as the shape of the hull, but then it was left inside as a building platform. So it's about three inches thick everywhere. And at the, all the way up at the bow, it's 18 inches thick of uh, stainless steel, fiberglass, and cypress. So this is a tough, tough boat. It's uh, got a nine foot beam. It's about 42 feet on deck. And uh, right now she tips the scales about 38,000 pounds. So heavy, heavy boat. Uh, I'll explain what we got on the deck here. This is, uh, this is all firewood. We no longer need the fuel range that we did when we started the voyage, so cut these tops out and stuffed them full of firewood for our stove. We've got diesel fuel in this one and gasoline in, the, uh, in that all the way aft container. This is the mainsail here. It's about 435 square feet, if I remember correctly. That's the first sail I ever built. It's a triple reefed mainsail and real heavy cloth, and, and uh, so far I haven't had any problems with it, so excited about that. Headed forward here, we have the main mast, which custom boats a lot of times use very interesting things that you wouldn't suspect. Actually, both the masts on this boat are uh, aluminum light poles, and they're just outstanding. Light poles are made to shear off at the bolts if a car hits them, and the rest of the poles are very tough. This boat's been through a uh, well, it'll take a lot more than I can, so. Below deck, Samantha Merritt reveals the preparations for this epic journey. Hello, welcome aboard Empiricus. This is uh, a sailboat, but uh, it's also our home. Uh, let me show you around. When you come in the companionway, we have uh, uh, the engine controls, navigation, this is kind of the business end. Um, power bank, VHF radio. The other side here is the galley, it's the kitchen, boat speak. 
Uh, we have about 300 pounds of food just in the galley in a couple big deep wells uh, that go below the waterline, keeps everything cool. And then we also have food storage uh, forward. And beyond the kitchen, Merritt reveals a few comforts of home and their source of heat for temperatures that may drop below zero on the autumn Arctic seas. Through here in the cabin is uh, a bookshelf and uh, we have a couple of settees where you can sit down couches, essentially. Uh, my favorite item in the boat is the wood stove. Uh, I love being warm and uh, I only agreed to sell the Northwest Passage because Jesse had a wood stove. <laughs> Moving forward towards the front of the boat, this is the mast, goes right down into the keel. And uh, the stateroom, which is what they call bedrooms on boats. Yeah. Our bunk is here, there's a bunk. Uh, ordinarily somebody could sleep here, but we have a lot of winter gear uh, stowed, ready to go. It is tight, compact quarters. And in the heart of their living area, Merritt reveals one of the most crucial aspects of the operation. Uh, this is probably the most important place on the boat. It's our, our nav table. We started this year's voyage in Cambridge Bay. We're now on the south part of King William Island. And today we're going to leave and head north and east into St. Roch Basin. Uh, and then along uh, the James Ross Strait on the west shore of the Boothia Peninsula. Then we're going to cross the Baffin Bay and go over to Greenland. This is sound really easy, but it's probably going to take about two weeks. Osborne and Merritt have invested years of their lives in this journey. But after two winters, months of physical labor, and countless expenses, they remain optimistic. We have, uh, you know, the ice is starting to, to open up north of here between us and Bellet Strait. And um, it's a mixture of trying to get to Bellet Strait as early as possible without running into too much ice and putting ourselves in a pinch situation. Um, the reason for that is, is we want to cross Baffin Bay and get to Greenland before September really starts rolling on. So, uh, so that's our goal. There's not a lot on this planet that hasn't been done, and there are very few things that have been done very little. And this voyage for me raised the bar to a level that forced me to get better at what I love doing. I studied uh, Roald Amundsen simply because he was the one that made it, and so many didn't. And so many books were written about people who didn't make it through the Northwest Passage, but they had this great, awful story to tell. So uh, although Amundsen came through here like 110 years ago, everything that he did, all the, all the tactics he used were very, very valid and they worked for a reason. That's one of the reasons we didn't get in a hurry last year and we decided to stop in Cambridge Bay because you can't afford to push it in this place. Uh, if it lets you out, it lets you out, but uh, it's more of a tortoise and a hare routine. Slow and steady wins the race. West of Victoria Strait and the waters of the Northwest Passage, Victoria Island is a welcome sight. Victoria Island measures more than 200,000 square kilometers, roughly the size of Great Britain. But while Great Britain has a population of 64 million people, Victoria Island is home to less than 2,000. It is the second largest island in Canada and the eighth largest in the world.
Like King William Island to the east, Victoria Island is dotted by tiny lakes and rivers. It is also home to formidable land mammals. Muskox, known to Inuit as the Umingmak, are a breathtaking sight here. They roam the tundra, covered by a thick fur and an incredible inner coat locals call kiviat. It is said to be one of the lightest and warmest wolves on earth. On the ground, Dozens of tiny plant species have evolved to endure harsh winters here. Arctic plants are like icebergs. Roughly 95% of their mass is underground, storing valuable nutrients for spring. And amazingly, some Arctic seeds can remain preserved even when frozen for 10,000 years. One hundred twenty kilometers inland, the topography of Victoria Island begins to change. Vast expanses of tundra are replaced by soaring hills as we approach Mount Pelly. Mount Pelly is one of three hills that line the horizon, set in an area known as Oveak Territorial Park. These hills represent one of the great cultural legends of the region. Oral tradition says a family of giant Inuit were traversing Victoria Island in search of food. After weeks of starvation, the mother giant collapsed and died, creating one hill. Then the sun collapsed, creating another. Finally, the father Oveak fell, leaving behind one of the best known landmarks in the region. Stories like these are key to the cultural fabric of Victoria Island and the nearby community of Cambridge Bay. The stories and the local language are preserved by elders and organizations like the Katitmiot Heritage Society and the Katitmiot Inuit Association. My name is Pamela Gross, and I'm the program manager at the Kitakamut Heritage Society in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. The mandate for the society is to integrate traditional um, knowledge and language, so Inuinoctun um, language into the society and the practice that we do through delivering cultural programming.
We currently have five elders in residence at the Kijakumut Heritage Society, and um, so for eight months of the year, they come in part-time to work with us. We do programming that involves the elders quite frequently, and working with the, the children um, is something that we like to do a lot because um, we want to share the knowledge from not only the elders to the adults, but also to the children. So we do sewing during the day, and we also have cultural programming in the summers as well. Across town, Julia Owina is active in preserving another form of Inuit culture, traditional drum dance. We have a lot of uh, cultural activities here in Cambridge Bay, and um, we've been planning some for the last number of years for language maintenance and um, revitalization. And one of them we performed is the drum dancing, where it's passed on through not only generations, but it's traveled across from the far west, as far as Russia, as far as Alaska, through to the Delta, and to Ulukakto, NWT's most um, northeast community, to here in Cambridge in Nunavut. While drumming is similar throughout the north, each region has its own distinct style. There's differences in clothing, differences in dance styles. Our songs are shorter, they're more rhythmic and more upbeat. The first set of dances um, the girls will be dancing to will be Okumaksiut. Um, Okumaksiut is um, the story of the dance where people are traveling back inland from their summer uh, summer camps along the coast. The first dancers we have on the floor are my daughter Trisha, Kalinda, and Sarah. And I'm Julia and my husband Jerry. Julia Owina says her association has seen positive results by promoting drum dancing. She believes activities like this are important for the growth of the community. It tells people who we are and where we come from. Um, dance stories, a lot of the stories that are passed on from generation to generation is passed on through song and through dance. And um, since joining, we've been able to expand it to the youth in the community and the school in the community. And we have had a lot more people join. I think this is special because um, Inuit are a people that lived on the land solely from the land. Um, my grandmother's generation lived on the land and she moved into the community when she was a young adult and she's a unilingual speaker and for me I can't speak to my grandmother. I need a translator and we need to do more to help people that are not fluent in the language pass on what they know to us so that we don't lose who we are through our language. Fifteen kilometers west of Mount Pelly and Oveok Territorial Park, Cambridge Bay is a major hub of the Central Arctic region. It is home to more than 1,400 people, the largest stop for tourists and research vessels traveling through the region. Amazingly, archaeological sites here indicate a human presence dating back 4,000 years. 
a timeline that coincides with the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And like Joe Haven to the east, Cambridge Bay holds a strong connection to the early explorers of the Northwest Passage. Here in the harbor, the shipwreck Maud has been a landmark for more than 80 years. Named for the Queen of Norway, the ship once belonged to Northwest Passage pioneer Roald Amundsen, before being sold to the Hudson's Bay Company. It was later used as a floating warehouse and wireless station until it sank in 1930. Today, Plans are in place to bring the mod back home to Norway. And just meters away, on Cambridge Bay's lone pier, a unique vessel makes its summer home. The Martin Bergman is a research vessel dedicated to scientific, cultural, and archaeological study. It is named after one of Canada's most renowned Arctic scientists, killed in a 2011 plane crash, 700 kilometers to the northeast. My name is Adrian Shimnowski. I am the operations director for Arctic Research Foundation, and we are standing here in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. The Martin Bergman is a converted vessel. It was a trawling vessel from Newfoundland. Um, Martin Bergman uh, was one of the founders with this, for this idea, along with Jim Bosley and Tim McDonald. And uh, through their conversation, they decided that it would be a, a good thing to bring a small research vessel to the Arctic. The reason why the vessel stays here in Cambridge Bay is that the season is short. and. Um, Cambridge Bay is a perfect location to have a vessel and when the ice uh, clears we are able to start science work immediately. Um, if we are on the west or east coast and having to transit back and forth, we would never really get that full opportunity. This summer, the Martin Bergman will take part in multiple studies, gathering water samples, tracking Arctic char, even collecting soapstone for local artists. So this is our galley and mess. So it's uh, quite a small space, but we have everything that a typical kitchen would have. Uh, we have 12 people on board and we work 24 hours. So usually when it's time to dinner, we'll have six eating at a time, switching up. We are now on the bridge. So this is where all the fun happens on the ship. This is where we have all our instrumentation, our uh, GPS satellite. Also, this is where the Parks Canada crew set their uh, survey equipment. This is the lab space on the RV Martin Bergman. Um, in this lab space, we we check over AUV equipment or other scientific equipment. Today, the crew is preparing for their most anticipated mission of the summer. This AUV, or Autonomous Underwater Vehicle, is a remote-controlled probe that will be used to search for the lost ships of Sir John Franklin, last seen in 1845. Experts believe the HMS Erebus and HMS Terror sank not far from Joe Haven, off King William Island. Along with our vessel, we'll be rendezvousing with uh, the Coast Guard vessel Laurier, also uh, a Navy vessel, and uh, a private ocean, uh, oceans, one oceans north, 
and together this group of ships will be surveying and deploying different launches uh, in a coordinated effort. Personally, I, uh, I'm excited to be part of the project. Every day I, I learn more about the Arctic. Um, the collaborations with our partners is always growing. Um, and it's interesting to be part of history. Well, this story, uh, it, it kind of describes what it's like in the north. Uh, the environment is always changing. Whether it was 200 years ago or currently, we're always faced with the same conditions, that uh, weather can be unpredictable, it's harsh climate. Um, you could have all the technology in the world, but you're still going to face uh, the Arctic, the climate. And as the Martin Bergman sets sail, crew members are unaware they will soon be part of one of the world's great marine archaeological discoveries. The Martin Bergman and its autonomous underwater vehicle is just days away from playing a key role in locating the HMS Erebus that has been lost for nearly 170 years. From the waters of Wellington Strait and the rugged contours of King William Island, to the jagged icy currents of Victoria Strait, to the soaring slopes of Mount Pelly and Oveak Territorial Park. The landscapes and waterways of Canada's central Arctic region are marked by barren beauty and cultural wonders. It is a mix of centuries-old traditions new adventures and awe-inspiring wildlife. On a world-famous waterway, Northwest Passage, that continues to be discovered here on the edge of Canada. Northern Canada's Coronation Gulf. From the central Arctic hub of Cambridge Bay. To rugged islands and remote coast. Lining the community of Kugluktuk. Searching for Arctic gold. It's an area that geologists are drawn to, to, to make discoveries. A pristine river that has been a lifeblood for generations. My grandparents used it, and I'm still using it today. And recording climate change through rare Arctic plant life. Climate change is having a big impact in Kugluktuk. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada, over the edge.
In the heart of Canada's central Arctic region, remote Victoria Island lies 1,000 kilometers north of the province of Saskatchewan. And here, on the island's southeastern coast, Cambridge Bay marks the regional hub. The community is located just above the 69th parallel, more than 250 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Cambridge Bay is located in the heart of Canada's Nunavut territory. More than 80% of residents here are Inuit, originating from the southern and eastern regions of Victoria Island. Cambridge Bay is known locally as a Kalik Tutiak. It is home to more than 1,400 people, the largest community in Nunavut's Katikmiat region. It is a central Arctic crossroads with hospitals, schools, and a regional airport. It is also home to a distant early warning station, or dew station, constructed in 1958. It remains in operation, a key component of the joint US-Canada North Warning System. And while Cambridge Bay may look small to outsiders, it is growing. Throughout the community, construction is happening everywhere. From new hamlet offices and an Arctic college campus to state-of-the-art scientific and cultural facilities. My name is Norm Lozon. I'm the project manager for Ellis Dawn on the Canadian High Arctic Research Station project. We're in Cambridge Bay. The CHARS, or Canadian High Arctic Research Station, will make Cambridge Bay a scientific hub of the North dedicated to advancing Canada's role in polar science and technology. So this, the site might not look like much for now. To the left, roughly where that bulldozer is working right now, that's going to be the location of what is called the main research building. Construction for CHARS is expected to take three years. So these are the drawings of the project. This is the, uh, the main showcase of the project, what they're calling the main research building. The main spine of the building, which is all structural steel. And this is a, a peripheral section um, that is made of wood. So that'll be all blue lamb, uh, wood engineered wood construction here. And so it'll be quite the little building. Maybe what you're looking for here. That's the field of this building here. That's the main research building here. And these two housing units in the back. 
Lozon says construction is currently on schedule. But with Arctic summer almost over, keeping pace is crucial. I think the main difference uh, with respect to doing construction in the south is that you need to, you always need to remember uh, winter's always on its way. Any exterior work uh, becomes extremely painful and difficult to do after, depending on where you are in the Arctic, after you know late October it becomes very challenging. So you always want to prioritize the exterior work that you have to do to be done in the warmer summer months. The second challenge I would say is all the logistics that surround doing construction in the Arctic. There's no highways, there's no roads, you can't just drive materials up. Everything has to come by sea lift or barge, um, which adds another layer of complexity to doing construction in the Arctic. For Norm Lozon, the Chars project presents a rare opportunity, a unique workplace to experience the growth and progress of Canada's north. What makes this project unique for us is the, uh, the fact that it's probably the largest project that's ever been done in this region of Nunavut. And we're just very honored to be part of a, a flagship project like Char's. And while Chars is looking to Northern Canada's future, other projects are working to preserve the past. Cambridge Bay's Old Town is located on the east side of the bay. The original Inuit settlement site, dating back to the 1940s. In more recent years, the community moved west. Now, one of the old town's last remaining landmarks is a stone church built more than 60 years ago. But the historic structure has been without a roof for nearly a decade. My name is Pat Edwards. Uh, I'm a construction supervisor for the restoration of the stone church uh, here in Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. From what I can understand, now uh, there was a fire that had uh, occurred here approximately 10 years ago. I'm not sure of the exact date. And the roof had collapsed in on top of the building. And I guess the stonework and everything else had been deteriorating a little bit every year due to the inclement weather. Patrick Edwards is originally from Newfoundland but has called Cambridge Bay home for years. Well, actually, this is quite a unique and extra extraordinary structure for to be the roof of it for, I'm figuring, 10 years. I'm kind of surprised that the walls were left in such good shape as what they were. Uh, there was quite a bit of work to restore them, but uh, to get them back to where they were to, it took three weeks of hard labor for a couple of guys, and you know, so we're well underway. Restoration began just weeks ago, but like the Chars project, Edwards and his team have a short window until winter arrives. Today, our biggest goal is to fill in the cavity between the two stone walls. It is a two two-tier stone wall with a uh, cavity in between so that we can uh, mount our sill plates and make it secure for our roof. Our goal here is to have the complete roof system on and make the building secure so that there won't be no future damages to the building. And weeks later, from the air, it is clear Edwards and team are close to accomplishing their goal. Well, I think it's special because where the community was over here at first, and where people have landed here, there's a lot of routes to this side of the bay, 
and there's people that have, you know, like just came into a community for the first time in their lives, and the first thing that they've seen was this stone church. Heading southwest from Cambridge Bay and Victoria Island, we soar high above the open waters of Dease Strait. This Arctic waterway is roughly 30 kilometers wide, with Queen Maud Gulf to the east and Coronation Gulf to the west. Strait is covered in solid ice for nine months a year, separating Victoria Island from the Kent Peninsula, where the Arctic archipelago meets the North American mainland. The Kent Peninsula is a vast open expanse with Arctic tundra stretching as far as the eye can see. It is 169 kilometers long, part of the North American mainland, connected by a narrow eight kilometer isthmus to the southeast. The peninsula was first explored by Europeans in 1821 on Sir John Franklin's first voyage into the region. It has been a landmark for explorers and adventurers ever since. And to the south, the landscape begins to rise as Arctic tundra meets low rocky hills. Further, on the southern end of the Kent Peninsula, we reach Elu Inlet. It too boasts an incredible landscape. Bordered by Melville Sound to the west, and Mount Elu, and the Atibiac River to the east. Offshore, scenic islands dot the inlet. Back on land, the hills continue to rise as tundra is quickly replaced by solid rock. And it's that rock that has been drawing humans to this remote region for decades.
prospectors have been trying to harvest precious metals from the area surrounding Hope Bay since the 1960s. Some have even succeeded. Now, a new group believes there are more riches to be found. So far here at Hope Bay, there's uh, three uh, gold deposits that, that have been discovered. Here in the northern part of the belt uh, at, uh, at uh, Doris, uh, we have the Doris deposit. And uh, just uh, around 10 kilometers south of us here is uh, the Madrid deposit. And around 35 kilometers further south from Madrid is another gold deposit that is known as a uh, Boston deposit. TMAC Resources and team have been on this site for just a few months. They are still preparing for full operations. For now, the mine is in care and maintenance mode. But all around, remnants from past explorations can be seen including a passageway for future attempts underground. Where we're at right now is uh, the portal to the Doris North Underground. So this provides uh, access to, uh, to the underground workings of uh, the Doris North Mine. Uh, so this uh, is the entrance uh, to a decline that goes currently 3,300 meters uh, horizontally under the ground and around 120 meters uh, vertically. Alex Buchan says there are many reasons to be optimistic at Hope Bay, including its unique geological position located in an area known as a greenstone belt. A greenstone belt is, 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 is called a greenstone belt because typically uh, the rocks found in them are a, a dark green uh, color and uh, these occur in various parts of, of Canada and in, in, in a lot of places in, uh, in the rest of the country around the world uh, when you find this type of rock it is it is known to host uh, or contain gold and uh, and base metals and so it's an area that geologists are drawn to 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 make discoveries so here's the host uh, material here as, as you can see as I wet it up it's actually a, a light green uh, material so that is your typical uh, greenstone rock And while actual mineral extraction is in limbo, TMAC's team continues to survey the area, mapping and exploring the site for when operations begin. What you see here is a heliportable uh, diamond drill rig. And what it does is uh, it, uh, it uh, drills around a three inch hole into solid rock and it removes uh, the middle or, or, or center uh, core of that rock and brings it up to surface so that it can be analyzed so you can determine uh, whether or not that rock contains any uh, metals or minerals of interest. It's a very important part of uh, the exploration process. And inside the core shack, these samples are cleaned, logged, and measured for the quantity of gold they contain. We're in the Doris core shack. Rock core is taken from a drill site. It's brought in here and it is logged and uh, it is measured and organized so that the quantity of, of gold that can be found underground can be analyzed. After that point, it's taken over to the other side of this building and half of it is cut. Uh, half of the core stays here and the other half is sent to an assay lab in, uh, which is uh, 
treated and analyzed uh, chemically to find out how much uh, gold is in it. Alex Buchan is from this region. He says as the mine prepares for full operations, the outlook is positive. Some have suggested Hope Bay could hold at least 10 million ounces of gold, an amount worth billions of dollars. In other parts of Canada, in the Timmins, uh, Valdor region of Canada, where there's another greenstone belt, they've been mining for gold over 110 years. 170 million ounces of uh, gold has been produced out of that greenstone belt. And so the potential uh, for us uh, exploring and uh, here at Hope Bay is that we can see that history of development uh, over the course of the, the, the decades to come. I do believe that uh, there's a, a great deal of excitement in our region uh, to see this mo uh, project move forward. Uh, if we do go into production, uh, when we do, uh, there'll be hundreds of jobs created uh, and uh, uh, residents of this region will have the opportunity uh, to apply for work. Everyone is wanting to see this move forward. Heading west from the mine at Hope Bay, we trace the rocky terrain just south of Melville Sound. Here, the contours of the Naujat Hills and the Buchan Hills stretch for kilometers. And they lead to one of the region's most pristine waterways, Bathurst Inlet. Bathurst Inlet is a southern extension of Coronation Gulf, extending roughly 100 kilometers inland. The waterway is also home to the communities of Bathurst Inlet and Umingmuktok, home to the Inuit for thousands of years. The region was later settled by Europeans with the arrival of the Hudson's Bay Company and the Roman Catholic Church in the 1930s. Far below, the Chapman Islands line the horizon. They are uninhabited, scenic wonders. Located halfway between the 67th and 68th parallel. In total, the islands measure 211 square kilometers. A secluded gem of the Arctic archipelago. Twenty kilometers further west, we return to the mainland on approach to Cape Barrow. Cape Barrow is a rocky point of land featuring granite cliff faces and tiny streams. It is recorded as being called Hananek by local Inuit. Later, 
It was given the name Cape Barrow by Sir John Franklin during an 1821 expedition. Cape Barrow, like the Barrow Strait to the north and Barrow, Alaska to the west, was named in honor of Sir John Barrow, an English statesman and strong supporter of Arctic exploration. Beyond Cape Barrow, our trajectory changes as we reach the boundary of Bathurst Inlet and continue west. And in the distance, the landscape changes. The Jameson Islands are known as a geological enigma. Their sediments are unique to the area. Massive basalt cliffs topped with siltstones and sandstones. The Jameson Islands stretch 30 kilometers end to end, rising hundreds of meters high. Finally, to the southwest, Hepburn Island marks a new waterway. As we approach mainland North America and Canada's Arctic coast. Heading east along the northern extremity of the North American mainland, the contours of Coronation Gulf stretch more than 150 kilometers. Like many landmarks in the region, Coronation Gulf was named by Sir John Franklin in honor of the coronation of King George IV. The gulf is roughly 60 kilometers wide separating the mainland Arctic coast from Victoria Island to the north. And here, 20 kilometers east of the community of Kugluktuk, we begin to see signs of human civilization. All along this shoreline, makeshift shelters can be seen. They are camps used seasonally by local Inuit from Kugluktuk, hunting caribou and other animals, stocking up for winter. Further, with the community of Kugluktuk in the distance, we reach a local landmark. This is the Coppermine River, one of three major rivers feeding Coronation Gulf. And today, as summer edges into autumn, the river and its banks are pristine, with vivid colors all around.
10 kilometers inland, the contours of the copper mine lead to a key protected area in the region. It is Kugluk Territorial Park. Hello, my name is Alan Niptanatya. I'm a hunter and trapper and a fisherman, and we're in uh, Koluk Territorial Park. Kugluk Territorial Park lines the banks of the Copper Mine River. For years, the park has been known to visitors by a different name, Bloody Falls Territorial Park. It was named a National Historic Site in 1978. The reason it got named Bloody Falls was uh, from the 1700s when Samuel Hearn came down river with the Chippewans and they massacred a whole bunch of Inuit, uh, except one old lady. So that's why it's called Bloody Falls. But to us, we call it the whole local area. But for residents like Alan Niptanatiak, the Bloody Falls story is old history. He says today's residents see Kukluk Territorial Park as a valuable resource that they've relied on for generations. The schooners and that used to all come up the river into this area and fish, and they'd get loads of fish and take back with them to their other camps. That was before copper mine or Kolokto was ever a settled area. But before that, the people always came here. Our, our ancestors were always moving around with the game. When the caribou came in the summer, they hunted them. Then when the caribou moved away, they moved to fish. And today, Alan Niptanatiak continues that tradition. Throughout fishing season, his gill nets can be found spread across the river in search of Arctic jar. Just grabbing the float that, that anchors to the, the, the net. So I can uh, check the net for any fish. And you pull it up and look through it so you can see the fish. Got to untangle it from the net. Got to get it untangled and through the gill net. Another, another one. Today, it's a lot easier with the net. You just put it in the water, leave it overnight, and come back next morning and check it. So I have another. Another fish. Oh, another one too. There's a nice light one. Punk it on the head and make sure it's dead. So we don't squirm all over and jump around. Oh, there's another one. That's nice. Nice fresh fish. That way we catch all the nice bigger fish and leave, save all the smaller ones for uh, to grow. And we're done. We'll go to the shore and cut the fish up. Wash your hands and say thank you. On shore, Niptanatiak has his fishing operation down to a science. Gutting, cleaning, and finally hanging the fish to dry. 
gonna cut the fish up uh, to make it into dry fish. So I, I use a nice stiff knife. I'm not used to a fillet knife. So I'll cut, try to get all the meat without getting all the bone. And we'll just continue cutting them. It's good to have a very sharp knife. And then that goes for the dogs. After I cut the fillet off the fish, I'll cut slits into the flesh to make it thinner so that it dries quicker because you don't want it to sit too thick and then get uh, really soft and soggy. So you do one side, do the other side, and all the way down. And once I'm done with this, I'll put it in the water, wash it up. The reason we wash the fish is to get all the blood and the slime off of it. So that, because we eat the skin as well. When it's dry, it's, it's like a, a, a chewy gum. Wash the skin side first, get all the slime off of it. and where the water's moving again. So you can see it becomes nice and clean and shiny and the flesh all hangs down so it air dries really well. Then I hang it up with the skin facing on the outside. And what that does, we usually hang them with the skin out so the skin dries nice and it becomes a nice texture. Then within uh, probably an hour or two, we'll come back and flip them. After drying the fish skin side out, Nip Tanatiak flips it, completing the process. So after a couple hours of the fish sitting in the air and drying, all the water is off, we, we turn them inside out so that all the flesh is exposed. And what that does is, 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 is dry the flesh. See, these ones here are still wet, so they're, they're slipping. Usually we use a piece of wood I forgot the wooden paddle, so that, but that gets air into all these little slits and makes it dry really nice and fast. In a couple of days, we'll be eating that. Alan Niptonatiak lives on the banks of the Coppermine River. And while he enjoys a home and the comforts of modern life, he knows he is practicing traditions that date back generations. Uh, the park to me is, a, is historical just because my family used it, my grandparents used it, and I'm still using it today. And I, it's sort of my lifeblood. And also, it's our drinking water. All the water you have in town comes from this river. So we always try to make sure it is kept clean and clear so that animals and everybody else can have water. High above the contours of the Coppermine River, a blaze of incredible fall colors stretches as far as the eye can see. But locals recommend enjoying it while it lasts. It is now the end of August and snow could fall any day. Back to the coast and just west of the Coppermine River, we reach the community of Kugluktuk. 
and the shores of Coronation Gulf. Formerly known as Coppermine, Kukluktuk is the second largest community in the Kitikmiat region. It is home to 1,400 people, just slightly smaller than Cambridge Bay. The community is surrounded by rolling hills and by Arctic standards, lush vegetation. Kugluktuk even claims to be home to North America's northernmost golf course. But the golf season here may soon be expanding. Locals say signs of climate change are all around. Scientists have taken notice too. Kugluktuk's mix of harsh Arctic winters and summer plant life make the community an excellent base for climate change research. Today, researchers from the South are collaborating with the youth of Kugluktuk, studying plant life, part of a project that will encompass much of Northern Canada. The team says it is an ideal setup for researchers and the community, with young people gaining valuable research experience. My name is Sarah Desrosiers. I'm a Master's of Science student at the University of British Columbia, and we're in Kugluktuk, Nunavut. So we know climate change is a big, uh, has, is having a big impact in Kugluktuk, um, whether it being sea ice melting, sea levels rising, river levels and lake levels lowering, which has a huge impact on uh, plants as well. So different plants are growing, willows are growing out of control, which has an effect on berry productivity, which has an impact on uh, caribou migration, little lemmings, it's all connected. So what we're doing is we've been working with the high school, taking youth out on the land to our various monitoring plots to harvest berries. We weigh them and count the productivity levels every year to keep track of what's going on. So we, we end up taking about 20 students in grades 10 to 12 out to our monitoring plots and we get to train them in scientific monitoring. So they learn how to set up a plot, how to harvest different samples, basic experimental design, which in the future will help them land jobs in the environmental sector, whether it be mining, consulting, working for the government. What are you at? All right, two more meters. The project in Kugluktuk is part of a long-term study. How these berries change over time will give researchers an insight on the effects of climate change in the north. So we're gonna head out to one of our plots. They're 20 meters by 20 meters. And what we're doing is randomly sampling the land. So once we have our coordinates, we're gonna set out our, uh, we're gonna make our plot. So it, it's gonna be a 20 meter by 20 meter quadrat. Uh, put tent peg in and then run our 20 meters up, tent peg again, and so on until we have our square. From there, we're gonna start sampling. Uh, usually we take f about 50 samples, random samples using 25 centimeter by 20 se 25 centimeter quadrats. And as De Rosier and her team work on the shores of Kugluktuk, they are not alone. Today's project is part of a larger network, with four universities conducting similar studies throughout the North. 
So we've done collecting for the day from our plot here, our long-term monitoring plot. What we're gonna do is head back to the school where they have a lab and we'll be measuring, uh, weighing essentially the berries and counting and entering it into a lo our long-term database. Uh, we'll be coming back here next year and years to follow um, where we'll get a bigger picture of what the berries are doing uh, in terms of productivity. For De Rossier, the chance to work in Kugluktuk has been an opportunity she never expected to have and one she knows she will never forget. For me, it feels like a second home. I've been coming up here for four years. I actually started in my undergrad working on this program, so I've been able to build relationships. So I love the land, going out on the land, camping, fishing, picking berries, hunting, but I also really like the community and working with people here. Um, picking berries is a huge thing for a lot of women in, in the area, so it's nice to make that connection with them out on the land. From the pristine waters of Victoria Island and the Kent Peninsula, to the stunning Chapman Islands and rock formations of Cape Barrow, to the protected cultural waters of Kugluk Territorial Park. Coronation Gulf is where the Arctic Archipelago meets mainland North America. These waters are a northern gem. Remote shorelines holding centuries of secrets. Tiny outposts with stories of riches and tragedy. And bustling communities digging deep to protect the future. Here, on the edge of Canada.